Can I start? Yeah, 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 we can start. All right, excellent. So uh, thanks a lot also for inviting me here to give this lecture. And I will be presenting on some um, work done over the past uh, couple of years, maybe, on pulse-efficient transpilation and pulse-based VQE on cross-resonance-based hardware. So the overarching theme of this is how do you make the best usage of, let's say, the coherence time of your device and how to reduce the impact of noise. So the outline of the presentation is as follows. I will first go over some aspects of quantum chemistry and quantum control. And then I will talk mostly about how to make an improved usage of the cross-resonance interaction that we have on IBM hardware. And so here I'll cover uh, two papers. One is on pulse efficient transpilation, and the other one is more recent, dating back to uh, a couple of months ago, is pulse based VQE, a uh, study of pulse VQE on our hardware. So let's first uh, dig into quantum chemistry and quantum control. I'll quickly summarize what it means to do quantum chemistry on a uh, quantum computer. And one embodiment of this is to try and find, let's say, the ground state of a uh, molecule, for instance. And so the way that we can do this on a quantum computer is as follows. We have a fermionic problem, right? Which is described by a fermionic Hamiltonian as shown here. And we need to first encode this Hamiltonian into our quantum computer. And the reason why you need this encoding is simply because we have qubits and the qubits, they have different statistics than the electrons that you have in these fermionic problems. And so you can use various mappings like the Jordan Wigner, Bravi, Kitaev, or so on. And this will basically give you a qubit Hamiltonian, which is essentially a sum of Pauli operators with different weights. And now the task that we have is to try and minimize the energy of this Hamiltonian. We want to find a trial state psi of theta, so it's a parameterized quantum circuit that minimizes the energy, right? And this algorithm is the variational quantum eigensolver, and it has an interplay between a classical computer and a quantum one, where the classical computer will run an optimization algorithm to try and find the parameters theta that minimize the energy. And then the output of this is uh, the parameters theta, or for instance, also the minimum energy. Um, so this is one embodiment of quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. There are, of course, many different other applications in this domain, like, for instance, protein folding, trying to calculate reaction rates or maybe uh, higher excited states and so on. But I won't really discuss those. So we need a parametrized quantum circuit to run this VQE. And there's two approaches here. In the one case, you can go with a problem-inspired ansatz. And here what you do is you encode a certain structure of the problem into your quantum circuit. For instance, you could encode the excitations in the structure of the quantum circuit, right? This is, for instance, the unitary coupled cluster single excitation and double excitation. Now, if you try and encode this structure in the Hamiltonian, you will see that the circuits become very deep and in fact, somewhat too deep for noisy hardware. And so another approach that also exists are these hardware efficient ansatze. And this is basically a variational form that can efficiently be run on the hardware in the sense that it doesn't have too many gates. So it has a topology between the gates that matches the limited qubit connectivity that we have. And while you abandon some aspects of of the problem, not all, but some of them, this does lead to shorter quantum circuits. And so in this presentation, when I talk about the pulse VQE, I will be talking about this type of ansatz here, hardware efficient. Now, you, we can ask ourselves the question, well, what is exactly VQE, right? And I'm gonna take a very reductionist point of view here. A VQE is essentially an, an optimization where we have some parametrized quantum time evolution and we have some cost function that we want to optimize, right? And we do this with a classical optimizer. And this is a very generic way of looking at VQE. Now, 
Well, this type of control flow is in fact not new. It turns out that uh, optimal quantum control, which is a, uh, uh, another topic of research, another field, has been looking at these types of problems for a long time, several decades, in fact. For instance, in nuclear magnetic resonance, right, where people have been trying to shape pulses to, let's say, transfer excitations from one part of a quantum system uh, to another. And it turns out that this follows the same paradigm, where we have some parametrized quantum time evolution, and we have a cost function that we would like to optimize. A good example of this is the GRAPE algorithm. So what do we do in the GRAPE algorithm? This stands for Gradient Ascent Pulse Shape Engineering. In GRAPE, we have a control Hamiltonian, which has a drift part here and the control part. And we want to shape the control fields here in order to generate a certain target time evolution. All right. And uh, here we parameterize the control fields in a certain way. A typical way to do this is using a piecewise constant approximation, and we try and improve each sample here, all right? And you can see here a little bit some of the relationships with VQE, right? I mean, in VQE, we are usually optimizing parameters and gates. In optimal control, it's more common that we optimize parameters in, um, in pulses. Now, a very nice um, perspective article appeared in uh, 2021 here. And in this article, they discuss a little bit the different relationships between, for instance, VQE and quantum, quantum optimal control. And one thing that they point out here is that you can look at a quantum chemistry problem or whatever you're trying to, to solve with VQE at different abstraction levels. You can look at it um, sort of through the logical level here, which is probably the highest level that you could look at it. Um, going down a little bit more, you have sort of um, below error correction or encoding, you'd have the circuit level where we're looking at the gates with the parameters here. And then even deeper in the control stack, you can look at it at the pulse level where we in fact have parametrized controlled fields. And so in the remainder of the presentation, we'll be looking at a lot of algorithms and tasks through the lens of the pulses that are actually running on the quantum computer. And the idea is to perform the variational algorithm directly, let's say, by optimizing uh, pulses and see if that can actually bring us any further. Now, it turns out that uh, a few years ago, IBM exposed to its users the pulse level, right? So we have all the tools that we need to be able to control pulses through the typical Qiskit stack, right? So for instance, what I'm showing here in this uh, image is a depiction of a C0 gate or the pulses in the C0 gate. You can see here the cross resonance tones. You've got the echo structure in here and the module, the pulse module of Qiskit allows us to control all of this. And one of the reasons to expose this to users was precisely to be able to study novel pulse sequences, maybe look at dynamical decoupling um, from the perspective of pulses, and then also perhaps to perform tasks like optimal control and so on. And so we have the tools here. Now, the way that Qiskit Pulse works is the following. If you take a look at a quantum computer, you will typically have qubits, and these qubits are coupled to a readout resonator. So this means that we need to apply two types of pulses. The first type is applied to the qubit to control its state and maybe generate interactions with other qubits. And the second type is the readout pulses, which we would apply on a readout channel. And this we use to read out the state of the qubits. So in this presentation, we will be mostly working with pulses applied on to the qubits, either through drive channels or control channels. And here we really have the freedom to be able to control the pulse shape if you want, the parameters in the pulse shape. And although I won't be using it in this presentation, you could actually control every single sample that is played out by the arbitrary waveform generator shown here. So Qiskit Pulse provides you with a lot of control over these machines. And it's a very nice tool to, to leverage, let's say. And so with this, I want to start with the first topic here, a little bit more in depth, and talk about the pulse-efficient transpilation, how it works, 
and how we do it. In order for us to, to understand the pulse efficient transpilation on cross resonance based hardware, we first need to understand the cross resonance gate. So the cross resonance gate is a gate that couples two superconducting qubits. You can see them here. I've got one qubit at a frequency omega two, and I've got another qubit at a frequency omega one. And these two qubits are coupled through a harmonic element here, a resonator. And the cross resonance gate allows us to create an interaction between qubit one and qubit two by driving one of the qubits, here qubit one, at the frequency of the other qubit, right, qubit two. So for instance, if this qubit has a transition of five gigahertz and this one has a transition of 5.2 gigahertz, I would be applying a pulse to qubit one at a frequency of 5.2 gigahertz. And if I do that, I generate this form of Hamiltonian here. So this is known as the cross resonance Hamiltonian. You can see that there are a lot of terms in it, but it is basically uh, some rotations on one of the qubit, that is these terms. And then you have these controlled rotations, which depend on the Z operator of the other qubit. And so if you want to create a C not gate, what you need to do is you need to expose this term here, the ZX term. And it turns out that the ZX term is also the dominant one in this interaction. And if you were to write it out as a unitary operator, you would see that it looks like this. So it's not quite a C not gate yet, but with a few single qubit operations, you can transform this ZX evolution into a C not gate. And this, for instance, can be done in this way. If I choose an angle here for this rotation of pi half, and I apply a couple of single qubit gates, then I can transform this cross resonance gate here into a C naught, which when coupled with single qubit gates will form a universal set of gates. So how do we implement the C naught gate, right? The way that we do it is the following. We use what is called echoed cross resonance pulses. So I have here two cross resonance drives that create each a rotation angle of pi over four. And you can see here that they have two different phases. They have a difference in phase of exactly pi. And the reason for that is because we build in an echo structure into this pulse. You can see here that we do an echo on the control qubit. And this allows us in fact to echo away and remove certain of the unwanted terms in this Hamiltonian shown up here. And now on top of this, we have cancellation tones, which are shown here in blue. And these cancellation tones allow us to remove some of the extra unwanted terms that the echo does not compensate for. So the point now is that if I want to apply, for instance, an RZZ gate, and the backend only exposes to you a C not gate, then this RZZ gate will be transformed into this quantum circuit. So what you see here is that I do full entanglement with a C naught gate, and then I sometimes might do a variable but small angle theta here, and then I undo most of this entanglement. So this is somewhat wasteful in terms of coherence times on the device. And in fact, if I look at this from the perspective of the transpiler, I can then change this directly into a two qubit gate that does only the amount of entanglement that I need here, right? So this is the RZX theta gate, and then I have a few extra single qubit gates on the side. And so what we realized is that by scaling the cross resonance gates in a certain way, we could actually implement this gate based on the calibrated C naught gate without doing any extra calibration. And this is the idea behind the pulse efficient transpilation. The contributions here is to be able to create arbitrary SU4 gates by scaling calibrated C0 gates without doing extra calibration. The nice thing about this is that we can encapsulate this in a transpiler pass because we don't need calibration and because we have a set of well-defined rules, right? So this then allows us to abstract away these gains from the pulse level. And this is usually quite appreciated from some of the users because they don't necessarily always want to know 
all of the details of the pulse level. And most crucially, this scheme allows us to significantly reduce the duration of the schedules. And in this paper here that we published in 2001, we showed how we could actually use this in the context of a QAOA algorithm to improve the quality of the results that we would see. So how does this pulse scaling work? The first thing that we do is we recognize that what we in fact want to do is create a pulse with a variable area theta, because it is the area under the pulse which encodes the rotation angle. So the C naught gate provides us with calibrated pulses which have the right phase and amplitude and duration to create a pi over fourth rotation. And now what I can do is I can linearly scale the width here to create rotation angles that are below theta. And one of the reasons why you want to scale the duration um, is the following. First, it reduces the duration of the schedule, which means you use less coherence time. But also, when you start scaling the amplitude, you run into nonlinear effects that would otherwise need calibration. So this is why we first scale the duration of the pulse. It's because of these two reasons. Now, if you want really small rotation angles, at some point, you arrive at a width of the pulse here that is zero. And when that happens, what you want to do is you want to scale the amplitude. You have no other choice, so to speak. And it is for these small rotation angles that you might sometimes see some miscalibrations occurring with these, um, so to speak, uh, automatic procedures. And this is where some calibration can help a little bit. And so this here is showing a demonstration of the improvement uh, of this. And we did the following benchmarking experiment, right? So we have a RZZ gate implemented once with two C0 gates shown here below, and once implemented with an RZX gate with the scaled cross-resonance pulses. And so here you can see that you have the two C0, right? This is the pulse schedule for this circuit. They are rather long. And here for the same rotation angle, you have a much shorter schedule that also has less cross resonance pulses and shorter ones. And we benchmarked this using process tomography. This is shown here. We have the angle theta, which is the angle in these two circuits. And we do the benchmarking for uh, several gates. And you can see here that the scale version always outperforms the double C naught implementation. And the main reason for this is simply because of the shorter schedules. You can see here the reduction in error. We get almost a 50% reduction in the error, depending on uh, the angle. Of course, the longer the angle, or the larger the angle, the longer the schedule, and therefore the less gain in error. And the other thing that I mentioned is that you can have some miscalibrations that pop up in the gate when you do this automatic scaling. And you can see these here in terms of the angle that you effectively implement. So we have some small unitary error that has built up, but the savings that we make in coherence time largely um, outweigh uh, these small little errors here. And this is why we have a larger gain in fidelity. Now, in the previous slide, I showed you an RZZ of theta gate, but you can actually use this scheme in the decomposition shown here in order to create arbitrary gates on two qubits. And here we sort of sample arbitrary gates. We plot the relative duration of the pulse, or sort of of the scaled gates as a function of the um, C naught based implementation. And we can see that we are overall shorter and have less error, which is very nice. And in the next few slides, I will actually show how we automate this in a transpiler pass. And so we use the KAK decomposition to create a decomposition where we have these angles alpha, beta, and gamma. And then we can scale the corresponding RZX theta pulses. So let's take a look at the circuit that I've shown up here. Uh, this circuit doesn't have any particular uh, meaning, let's say. It's just a bunch of two qubit in, uh, instructions, one after the other. But we will send it through the transpiler pass to see sort of what comes out. So the transpiler pass that does the pulse-efficient transpilation is shown here. 
we need to do a first thing, a first few things, where first we collect all of the two qubit instructions in blocks. Once we have done that, we decompose them using the KAK decomposition, right? So we compute these three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, which allow us to represent any two qubit gate. And once we have done that, we can start building the schedules of these pulses by stretching the calibrated schedules of the C0 gate. So this is what is done in this transpiler pass. And then we do a little bit more optimization here to simplify and reduce the single qubit gates that might be uh, within, uh, uh, that might be exposed to the transpiler. So let's walk through this. Once I first apply this part here, you will see that I now have collected these different two qubit gates into two different unitaries here. And then the second part here decomposes them. And so here the overall circuit looks a lot longer, but in fact, if you were to look at it from the pulse schedule, it would be a lot shorter. And the reason for that is simply because a lot of pulses are typically buried in the C0 gate. And what's more is you can see that a lot of the single qubit pulses in between some of these gates have been removed. And this is another aspect of the pulse efficient transpilation is that by exposing single qubit pulses like echoes and single qubit pulses before and after cross resonance gates to the transpiler, you actually allow the transpiler to simplify away a lot of these single qubit pulses. And so overall, this results in a schedule which is a lot shorter, even though the quantum circuit looks a lot longer. So this is kind of exactly what I, what I said. The echoes are exposed to the transpiler. You can see them here. It's these X gates. We never have more than two square root of X pulses in between the cross resonance gates here. And keep in mind, that this decomposition here, R of Z, square root of Z of X, R of Z, square root of X, and R of Z is universal in the sense that it allows you to represent any single qubit gate, right? So if you look at this circuit here, every instruction is a single pulse, and this is really the minimum number of pulses that you need in order to implement this circuit. And then also another thing to point out here, if you're familiar with Qiskit, you will see now that we have this little cow here. And this simply indicates that we have a pulse attached to the gate. So with that, I'm at the end of the first part on the pulse efficient transpilation. The main point of the pulse efficient transpilation is that you can make a better usage of the coherence time and use pulses more sparingly if you actually look at how the different gates are implemented and if you expose that to the transpiler. And now I'd like to show something related, which is how we implemented Pulse VQE on our hardware. So I'll be going over this paper here. And what this is showing is a study of the pulse-based, um, uh, yeah, on the pulse-based VQE on, on our hardware with these three molecules. The H2, which requires two qubits, the H3, which requires six qubits, and the H4, which requires eight qubits. And in these cases, I will show you that we were able to reduce the duration of the pulse schedules and get better results for the energy. But before that, I also want to go over some of the previous literature uh, that was published in, let's say, the last year on the topic, because there has been quite a lot that was done. So in this paper here, the authors they learn the amplitude only uh, of the pulses. And they show that this has some benefits. Crucially, however, the problem here is that this misses, let's say, reductions in the duration, which would make a better usage of the coherence time. In another related paper, the authors showed a, a variational ansatz using pulses, where the amplitude and the frequency of the pulses uh, was made variational. So here I, I found it a little bit strange that the authors parameterized the frequency, but uh, they showed gains as well. Yeah, so I think that overall this was a nice contribution. Then here we have the control VQE algorithm. So here the authors demonstrated that by using, let's say, um, 
pulse is parameterized by a duration and an amplitude, right? So we have square pulses that they can actually get very nice results. However, in here, there was no hardware demonstration. Another nice paper that came out is the one shown here, where they showed that by using pulse level variational algorithm in simulation, they could actually have cases where leakage speeds up the algorithm. So leakage means that population leaves the computational subspace. But if this population comes back into your computational subspace, then this actually, at the end of the algorithm, doesn't have much of a penalty, right? And it can also be beneficial to speed up certain processes. And this is something that has also been seen in the context of designing gates and optimal control, where if you let, for instance, the states evolve outside of the computational subspace, for instance, in the higher levels of the transmon, then you can actually have faster processes. And then finally here, we have another nice paper that appeared in December, which does uh, the following. It, it uses the amplitude as a meta parameter. So it doesn't really optimize it during the algorithm, but it fixes it beforehand. And then it optimizes the duration. And then they did a demonstration on hardware for H2 and simulations on two and four qubits uh, for so on in silico. And uh, this kind of shows a little bit that you can actually get some gains by doing the QE at the pulse level. So what I want to do now is to show you how we constructed the Ansatze in our uh, paper. So we start off with a hardware efficient real amplitude Ansatz. This is shown here, right? So we have RY rotations with parameters, and then we have C naught gates, which correspond to the coupling map of the hardware. Right, so this is one layer of a hardware efficient ansatz. And we call this the real amplitude simply because if you look at the states that are created, they don't have phases. It is only going to be real amplitudes. Now, when looking at this from the pulse level, what we do is the following. We first take the RY gates shown here and we replace them by a single drag pulse with a parametric amplitude. So I denote this as Rx in the quantum circuit, but please don't be fooled by the fact that this might not be an Rx pulse. And then what we do is we take all of the cross resonance gates here and we replace them by a single cross resonance tone depicted as a Gaussian square pulse, right? So this is what the variational ansatz would look like. And then in some of the cases, what we also did is we added R of Z gates here in order to control the phases of the pulses. Because in these cross resonance pulses, the only thing that we optimize here is the duration and the amplitude of the Gaussian square and not the phase. And we then bring this in in some cases here. So let's take a look at how, how this might fall. Uh, how this might look like. What I have here to the left is a C naught based ansatz for two qubits. We have a C naught gate here and sandwiched between we have the RY rotations. If I were to transpile this to the, to the hardware and schedule it in terms of pulses, it would look like this. And the only variational parameters that we optimize are these phase changes here, right? So this is really what the circuit is doing. The circuit is just optimizing phase changes. The rest of the pulses stay the same. Now in the pulse-based ansatz, here I have a depth two ansatz. If I schedule this, you can see here that we have the two drag pulses shown here. Then we have some frame changes here. These correspond to these two instructions. And then we have the cross resonance tone here shown here. Right. And so a couple of comments to make. And this is something that we saw in simulation. If you do this on H2, the depth one C naught based ansatz exactly reproduces the ground state of H2. The C naught here is by far the longest gate. And then we have a lot of extra complexity here in the form of these drag pulses before and after. The pulse schedule already looks a little bit simpler in the case of the pulse-based ansatz. You can see that we have a depth two ansatz here. So we have twice this block here. And we only have now four single qubit pulses with variable amplitude. And we have 
two cross resonance tones. And so the optimizer will try and change the amplitude and duration of these, as well as the amplitude of these and the phases. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that the control electronics has some constraints, namely all the parameters in the um, amplitudes, they are expressed as a percentage of the arbitrary waveform output. So they need to be in the range minus one to one. The duration of the pulses has to be a multiple of 16. And this simply has to do with the constraint that the arbitrary waveform generators load 16 samples in their memory at a time. And so we somehow need to enforce these constraints. And the way that we did this is with what we call a wrapper function. The wrapper function is something that takes a variational parameter theta, which is exposed to the classical optimizer, and maps it in one case to an amplitude, and in some other cases, it's a duration. So let's take a look at this Gaussian square here. We're optimizing the duration and the amplitude. The wrapper function for the duration was chosen to be a discretized sine wave. And so we have the optimized parameter here, theta, which is what the VQE would optimize. And then the parameter in the pulse here is um, a sinusoidal function of this one here, also to constrain it to a certain range. But crucially, if you zoom in on it here, you will see that I have discretized it so that the parameter here can only be multiples of 16. And this allows us to load the pulse to the arbitrary waveform generator. For the amplitude, we also use a sine function wrapper, and this then constrains the pulse amplitude in the interval of minus one and one. And this means that we never exceed the maximum output that the arbitrary waveform generator would be able to produce. So the first test is to do this on uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen is sort of the hello world, if you want, of, uh, of VQE. And uh, here we saw that the pulse-based ansatz performs more or less the same as the c not based variational form. And the reason for that is simply because the schedules are actually quite short when compared to the T1 time. So the c not based schedule lasts about 750 nanoseconds, and the pulse-based one lasts about 210 nanoseconds. So the H2 is not a particularly interesting um, case to show, but it is kind of a sanity check. So it shows here that the pulse-based ansatz performs about as well as the C01. And one of the reasons why we still have certain errors here between the ideal and what was measured is simply because you have things like readout errors uh, that, uh, that impact. Now, the next molecule that we studied is a little bit more challenging. It is the H3 system. So it is in fact three hydrogen atoms spaced uh, in a triangle like this. It will be varying the angle between them. And if you break down, uh, or if you map this Hamiltonian to the hardware, you will see that we need to measure 62 Pauli terms and we can group them into 21 sets of commuting terms. This means that we need to do 21 uh, different basis changes. So in effect, at each iteration, we are measuring 21 different circuits. We used the uh, chip IBM Lagos for this, which is a six qubit device. And we looked at a depth one variational form for the CNOT based ansatz shown here. And then also a depth one ansatz for the pulse based, which is shown here. And you can see that they more or less have the same the same structure, and that is that is intentional in order to have a fair comparison. Now, one thing that we did first is just to assess the performance of different C0 based ansatz at different depths. So we tried repeating the C0 ansatz with depths one, two, and three. Each time we choose different initial points here, each time we average over three different initial points, and we see what looks best. And it turns out here that the depth one ansatz is the one that performed best in this context without doing any error mitigation. And this means then that we sort of pursued the rest of our experiments with a depth one ansatz. So now let's see how this actually holds up. What I'm plotting here is on the x-axis, the angle of the molecule, right? So this alpha, I'm doing a VQE 
at every angle, and then I plot the energy that comes out. And we will be comparing this to the exact value obtained with full configuration interaction. And one thing that we can do here is to try and see how well we can find the minimum of this curve. That is the angle between the atoms, which minimizes the energy of the system. And so if I look at the C not based ansatz, without any readout error mitigation, I obtain this curve here. And this will claim then that the minimum of the energy is at around 36.4 degrees. Now let's take a look at the pulse-based version. You can see that this is already better. The curve is closer to the full CI, which is good. And the minimum angle that it reports is 30.1 degrees. So this is a nice improvement. And now in this particular case, we also asked ourselves, well, how would these results improve if I added readout error mitigation? And so you can see here that if I add readout error mitigation to the CNOP, we get a little bit better, but there's also a bit more variability in the results here. And we don't resolve the minimum as well. And in fact, this alpha minimum claimed in the second run with error mitigation or readout error mitigation is worse. Right? Compare this to the ideal 29.3%. And finally, we repeated the pulse-based VQE with readout error mitigation. And you can see that it gets even better. This is by far the best curve that we measured in terms of its distance with the ideal energy. Interestingly though, the angle that it reports here is a little bit worse than the pulse-based with, without the readout error mitigation. So this might suggest a little bit of added variability from the readout error mitigation. If you look at the pulse schedules, you'll see that they are much simpler. This is the pulse schedule for the pulse-based VQE. We can see here the five different cross resonance pulses. And this is the pulse schedule for the c not based variational form. There's a lot of stuff going in here to cancel all of the unwanted interactions in the c knots or in the cross resonance. Whereas in this case, we simply let the uh, quantum computer provide us with its hardware native interaction, and then we let it figure itself out. Interestingly, and this is sort of expected, we have short and intense pulses, meaning that we are sort of favoring shorter schedules in order to minimize the effects of T1 and T2. The final test that we tried is H4. This is a larger, uh, larger system. It requires eight qubits, and it now has 35 sets of um, commuting Pauli terms that are measured together. So we need to measure every circuit 35 times in different bases. We looked at a CNOT ansatz with depth one and two, and then we looked at a pulse ansatz with depth one, once without the RZ rotations, and once by bringing these back in. The results are shown here. The depth one C0 converges quite quickly to a certain energy. The depth two C0 takes more time, but arrives at lower energies. You can see this here. And the reason why it takes more time is simply because it has more parameters that need to be optimized. The pulse-based ansatz has a lot more parameters, 32 in fact. And this is also why it takes quite a bit of time to converge. But overall, you can see that it arrives at a lower, lower value here. And then finally, we did the optimization once more, but we only optimized the RZ parameters, assuming the optimal parameters for the amplitudes and durations taken from the blue curve here. And if you re-optimize the phases, you can see that you arrive at even better values for the energy. And so this then shows that you have, let's say, uh, some gain by optimizing the phases as well. Once again, if you compare the schedules, you will see that the pulse-based variational form is about 80%, um, or sort of is 20% the duration of the C01. It's a lot shorter. I haven't included the single qubit pulses here because it would actually become way too messy. But if we only look at the C0, uh, the cross resonance pulses, you'll see it's a lot shorter. Also, what we see very quickly is that the optimizer tends to push up the amplitude of the pulses once again, to favor um, intense but short pulses. So um, in the next few minutes, uh, I'll sort of conclude, but I do want to say one or two words about error mitigation. 
what we have gained with this pulse-based VQE is a lot shorter pulses and better results. But one thing that we did sacrifice is the uh, intuition on what the pulses are doing. I no longer have a gate-based description which tells me what is the pulse that should ideally be implemented. And this can be a little bit of an issue for certain error mitigation forms. For instance, in probabilistic error cancellation, what we typically do is we learn the layers of Clifford gates, and then we try and invert their noise. This means that you need to know the noise of the gate. And so I think it will be interesting um, in the future to research how we could combine uh, pulse-based variational quantum eigensolvers with error mitigation schemes like this one, which require a gate-based description. And I think that we can probably find a little bit of an in-between between the two. The other important error mitigation method is zero noise extrapolation. There's two ways of doing it. Either you stretch the pulses, and this requires that you also know what is the gate that you want to implement, or you can fold the pulses as shown here. So for instance, a C naught can be repeated three times and logically it's still equivalent to one C naught. And this is a way of implementing the noise. We haven't tried implementing this in the pulse-based VQE, but one way that you could implement the digital version is by repeating a pulse several times, but changing its um, amplitude by a phase of pi. And this would effectively allow us to implement the digital scheme. And this is something that would need, I would say, a little bit more research. And so with this, I'll conclude, and hopefully this leaves a bit of time for uh, some questions. But so I think the main point here is that the pulse level allows us to improve on quantum algorithms in many different ways, either by pulse efficient transpilation or using this pulse-based VQE. And in the case of the pulse-based VQE, we were able to observe better results with shorter schedules. One thing to point out also is that we did not do kind of the full optimal control version um, that, for instance, Grape would do by, let's say, time slicing every pixel and trying to optimize that. And I think this opens up a lot of nice directions for research, right? So how do we best do error mitigation at the pulse level? How do we find pulse-based ansätze that reduce the number of parameters? And what is a good strategy in choosing a pulse-based ansatz? And so with this, I'm pretty much at the end of the presentation and welcome any questions if you have any.